So the microglia possess a memory, and repetitive stimulation can lead to chronic inflammatory state in the central nervous system. A couple of studies, and this was one of the big breakthroughs, and this only happened in 2011 when these studies were published. This is brand new data. In 2011, two studies come out. One is looking at uh, that long term they've been studying uh, adolescents who are binge drinking. All right? That upregulates microglia. Okay? You stop binge drinking, and the microglia stay upregulated for as long as a decade. Ten years after you stopped it, you still have this hyperactivity of the microglia. It's a long term neuroinflammatory process. You know, with alcoholics, we say that their developmental stages stop at the point that they start drinking. There's actually neurophysiology to explain this. And it's only when they stop drinking. And it's only as we go through a process of allowing the neuroinflammation to degrade that the brain starts to regenerate. And they start growing again neurologically and socially. We know from a two-hit seizure model that if we create seizures, which is another way of creating hypoxia and ischemia, for that matter, to the brain, and uh, multiple seizures results in an upregulation of the microglia. And so when the microglia are upregulated from that, they again maintain the memory of that. So there's a different genetics that make people more or less susceptible to this stuff. I have one patient who took 10 concussions and walked away from all of them until the 10th and then topped that off with some biotoxicity and then the microglia tripped over and she went into a chronic neuroinflammatory state. I have other people who get a concussion and they've got the problem. So we have to think about this in thinking about this as a neuroinflammatory disease, as a disease which can stay upregulated for an extremely long time in our systems. The spinal cord, when we've got this business where we've got segmental pain coming from uh, the myofascia, from the muscles, from the tendons, from the ligaments, or potentially the joints, and we don't have anything else going on, all right, you get a pain or a neuropathic pain to a nerve and you don't have any psychological issues. This is really central sensitization and not central sensitization syndrome. So that's to be distinguished as different from central sensitization syndrome, which involves a neuropsychiatric component to the pain. If all you've got is pain without the neuropsychiatric component to it, and by the way, what comes into play here is not just muscular pain, but irritable bowel syndrome is believed to be a type of central sensitization that occurs <coughs> with motility dysfunction um, in the spinal cord. And again, this is upregulated through activation of microglia. But that's where the pain problem sticks. It stays at the level of the spinal cord, does not move into the higher uh, brain centers, central nervous system. <coughs> and that's just a picture of that. Again, simply reemphasizing re chronic central sensitization equals chronic pain plus neuropsychiatric conditions. They are neuroinflammatory, neurodegenerative, and neurodysregulatory. So let's talk about the ideologies of central sensitization syndrome when we started to talk about it because now we understand what the target is. All right? Think about this. We had no idea what the target was, what the cause was. If you have a heart attack, I know what the target is. It's your heart. It's the arteries in your heart. I've got to go fix those. I've got to do something about those. All right? You break an ankle. I know the problem is the bones. I've got to go fix the bones. I've got to reset them. If you have chronic pain, until just recently, we had no idea what the target was. If you have depression, until just recently, we had no idea what the target was. If you have post-traumatic stress syndrome and you have generalized anxiety disorder, until recently, we had no idea what the target was. We know what the target is. The target is microglia. And understanding microglial physiology allows us to completely rethink how we're treating these diseases. So, Trauma, as we discussed, both physical and psychological. Infectious diseases, which come in a whole variety of flavors. Uh, toxins, such as heavy metals, lead, mercury, uh, cadmium, arsenic, biotoxins, medications, sleep disturbances, sleep apnea, circadian rhythm disturbances. I've got my kids in particular, although this gentleman I just talked to uh, today, uh, what time do you go to bed? Well, it depends. Some days I don't. 
Some days I go to bed at 3 in the morning. Some days I go to bed at 10 at night. Some days I won't sleep for a day. And then I'll sleep a few hours the next day. All right? This is what a brain that's inflamed looks like. It's chaotic. And the more you allow it to go on, the worse it gets. Metabolic disorders, thyroid disease, hypothyroidism in particular, or hyperthyroidism. And then this autoimmune category. Okay? Celiac disease. Celiac disease is an intolerance to gluten. But celiac disease is a very interesting problem. It's a genetic disorder, kind of. How do you kind of have a genetic disorder? 35% of the population is predisposed to developing celiac disease genetically. Of that, only 3% of the population will actually develop it. So everybody gets exposed to gluten because basically celiac disease is genetic predisposition plus wheat. <coughs> gluten being the protein in wheat. Why only 3% of the population? Well, there's something else that happens that trips over this group of people into developing celiac disease. So on the whole, celiac disease only affects 1% of the population. It affects, uh, there's gluten intolerance, which is the inability to, it's another, we don't understand the immunology of this yet, but it affects somewhere between 6 to 9% of the population. And there's a lot of symptoms that are very similar to celiac disease without some of the attendant autoimmune processes we see going on. How important is this? I had a 17-year-old kid come into my office a few weeks ago. Uh, he's been diagnosed with Asperger's. Uh, he's suicidal, uh, severe depression. So we said, okay, I don't think about things as, as depression anymore. I think about them as neuroinflammatory diseases. So we start looking around for what the issues are. All right? We did testing for him for celiac disease, amongst other things that we went to look at. He has celiac disease. He has celiac disease. We took him off gluten about a week ago, so we're still early on on this. We are four days, five days into this diet. This kid sleeps for about three days. And all of a sudden, he's engaging with his parents and his brother. He's talking about a future. Something has changed radically in this kid's brain. And this is just within a week of stopping gluten. We'll see what happens over time. There are reports in the literature of people who were diagnosed and institutionalized with frank schizophrenia, which when you, a small percentage of them, turned out to have celiac disease. And when the, celiac, when the gluten was removed from the diet, the schizophrenia diagnosis disappeared. When we think about these things as neuroinflammatory diseases, we ask a different set of questions, we do a different set of tests, and it gives us a different set of opportunities to fix things. We have to be smart about what we're doing and we have to be thoughtful about what we're doing. When we go to treat these things, there's a lot of things we have to bring into considerations. So we need to, at the very basis, basically three steps. What's creating the problem? Have we got an ongoing issue? Are you sitting in a moldy house? Do you have mold toxins in you? Do you have Lyme disease sitting in you? Do you have celiac disease or some other underlying nutritional problem? So what's going on in terms of the underlying problem? We need to address that issue. Once we address that issue, we need to then talk about the things that are neuroregenerative. All right? And there are simple things you can do for yourself. So meditation. Meditation is neuroregenerative. All right? We know that in long-term meditators, that they have significantly increased gray matter than in non-meditators. Okay? So great. So if you want to climb up on the hill for 30 years and meditate, we'll increase your brain mass. Except that, two years ago, a study comes out of Mass General uh, and UMass Amherst, where they took people in eight-week meditation training program for 20 minutes a day, and lo and behold, their brain mass increased. The gray matter increase is measured on uh, functional MRI studies. 20 minutes a day, eight weeks, Increase gray matter, neuroregeneration. The only way you can do that is downregulate microglia and turn them into neuroregenerative processes as opposed to neuroinflammatory. So meditation downregulates microglia. Exercise, as we talked about in the mice, 
downregulates microglia and turns on pro-growth factors in the central nervous system. Proper nutrition becomes essential to this process. Sleep. Again, we want to make sure that you're getting proper sleep in proper time periods and that you're also not getting apoxic. You're not getting sleep apnea. Medications. We need to be very smart about the medications we're using. We want to be real judicious with our use of opioid medications, benzodiazepines. And we want to think about other medications that you wouldn't think of normally for treating these conditions. What medications? Doxycycline, minocycline. It's an antibiotic, but it also downregulates microglial activity. Low dose naltrexone downregulates microglial activity. I have a kid who came in to see us recently who have hyperacusis, his chronic migraine. The migraines have been controlled by Depakote, but the hearing problem remains a very serious issue. His, this is one of the things you see with chronically upregulated and inflamed brains. So we put him on low dose naltrexone as a beginning treatment with him. His, tre his hearing is 50% better than it was. Dramatic improvement just with treating that component of it. Now it also turns out that he's got biotoxicity disorder. We're going to treat that now as a stimulus in terms of what's going on. So lots of things that we need to do. Psychotherapy. Why psychotherapy? One of the things that has to happen now, if we think of this as a neuroinflammatory disease, is we have to think of this as a progressive disease that is cumulative over time. We have in the past thought about disease as an event, not a process. We were wrong. There is an accumulation of traumas to the brain that ultimately results in the expression of depression and pain. Example, I have a young woman in her 30s come to see me who has got fibromyalgia. She associates this with a car accident that took place when she was 18 years old. It is not an uncommon story to hear people talk about uh, getting in a car accident and then degrading into fibro. Okay? But I know better than that. I know that that's not enough. I know that there has to be something that's primed it, so I'm asking more questions. What do I find? I find that at 12 years of age, she's raped. Why is that important? Because she has post-traumatic stress syndrome. Why does she have post-traumatic stress syndrome? Because when she starts talking to me about the rape, she is shaking, she is in tears, she's totally withdrawing, her voice is changing. This has never been addressed for her. Now I know that unless we address the post-traumatic stress component of this, we will never fix the pain component of this. <coughs> and so psychotherapy becomes a very important tool for us in the process of addressing this stuff. We've got to hit it from all angles. All right? Physical therapy. The other piece that we have to pay attention to is what are all the peripheral generators. So if there's problems with chronic tension in the musculature, there's problems with chronic sprains or tears in the tendons and the ligaments, we have to make sure that we identify thoroughly all of the peripheral things that keep creating pain for us. Because if you keep creating pain from the muscle skeletal system, that too upregulates the microglia. And so what we have to do is a very careful search of identifying all of the other factors that are coming into play from the muscle skeletal system, all the inputs that keep things fired up. And so we've got to be very thorough and very careful at addressing the muscle skeletal system and getting that functioning optimally as well. So physical therapy does that. We do that with trigger point injections. We do that with manual medicine. We do that with prolotherapy, proliferative therapy, in terms of repair of tendons and ligaments. And that's one of the lectures that uh, Dr. Jeff Erickson will be giving uh, as we go through this process. So understanding the physiology of microglia will provide us with a new insights into a unified theory about how we get sick, why we stay sick, and how we can recover. It also provides us with the physiologic imperative for an integrative approach in our medical care, where we bring things like acupuncture, which is also early evidence showing neuroregeneration and a reintegration of the central nervous system in the way it processes information. Utilizing meditative techniques, utilizing nutritional approaches, utilizing uh, hypnotic approaches and helping people in terms of their sleep disorders, utilizing uh, meditation and psychotherapy in terms of helping address their 
psychological component of what's going on with these diseases. We've got to be thorough, we've got to be comprehensive. We have to talk about structural reintegration in terms of how the body relates to itself from a muscle skeletal standpoint, because if we don't do that, we keep pain generated in the periphery. So we've got to think about environmental toxins, we've got to think about infectious diseases, we've got to think about a whole new array of issues when people come in and tell me they're depressed and tell me that they're in chronic pain. And unless we think about these things, we will continue to have that 9% result, which is a disaster. And if we take a different approach to this, we can hopefully save a lot more people a lot of grief and return them to normal health. Thank you for your attention. This has been a lot of stuff. It is a very different way of approaching this. Uh, it's one that we've been pioneering at our center, uh, and it's one that brings together and explains a lot of why all this other stuff we've been looking at is so important. But it also forces us to rethink this stuff and now gives us new targets. It gives us a new way to, we need to find the biomarkers for this stuff. We haven't done so yet. But we can see a lot of stuff, the symptoms, and now think of it from a physiologic standpoint because the research allows us to think about it from a physiologic standpoint. And so the biomarkers will come because now we know what to go look for. Now I, can, I will eventually get to a point, and in fact, the new uh, DMS-5, which is the way we categorize various psychological disorders, just came out, uh, and it's twice the size of the old one. All right, it's about a description of different leaves on different trees. It doesn't talk about the basis of all of this and what drives it. The head of the National Institute of Mental Health turned around as soon as it was published and said, nice book. We'll use it as a dictionary, put it off to the side. We will be defining all of our conditions based on the physiologic studies. And there's an article that just came out in JAMA that we actually may have the first markers on functional MRI for actually defining depression. So there's huge breakthroughs coming through now when we stop talking about descriptions of these things, which is a nice 18th century way to do things, and we start thinking about the physiology of these things. We talk about it from a scientific perspective as opposed to a descriptive perspective. This is a massive sea change. This is the first true paradigm shift since I have been in medicine, a way of rethinking and redefining these illnesses. And it's going to lead to a lot better solutions for everyone suffering with these conditions. Thank you. If you've got any questions, I'll be glad to entertain them.